Hey there, freaks. Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. We have an incredible conversation for you today with Chris Dannon from Iterative Capital. But before we get to that interview, I'd like to introduce this week's sponsor. You guys know all about them already, BlockFi. A lot of people are forced to sell their crypto when they're trying to buy a house, fund a business, or even pay off their taxes. With BlockFi, you can keep your crypto and still pay for all your projects with a crypto-backed loan. Use your Bitcoin, Ether, or Litecoin and get U.S. dollar funded directly to your bank account with loan sizes ranging from $2,000 to $10 million. Lucky you if you're able to do that. BlockFi is perfect for reaching financial goals of all sizes. Visit BlockFi.com slash Tales from the Crypt to learn more about putting your crypto to work without having to sell. That's BlockFi.com slash Tales from the Crypt. They've got a little uh, little um, special deal for you freaks. So definitely go check it out. See what you can do there at BlockFi. These loans take minutes uh, to create and uh, is a cool service. Check them out. And I hope you guys enjoy this interview with Chris. I know I did. Tales from the Crypt. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. We are back in the relegation studio. This is the relegation studio. I didn't tell you that. Uh, uh, we're recording on a Wednesday night. It's Wednesday, right? Yeah, Wednesday night. Yep. Uh, here in Brooklyn, my uh, my wife is cooking dinner right now. So we've been relegated to the shared studio in my apartment building. Very excited for this conversation. We just had a little pre-talk, and I'm excited for the topics we're going to dive into. I want to introduce all of you freaks to the co-founder and partner at Iterative Capital, Chris Dannon. Chris, welcome to the pod. Hey, Marty. Thanks a lot. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming on. It's a long time coming. Yeah, my pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, you're one of my favorite people to meet up with in New York City and talk about Bitcoin. Thanks, and man. The, Likewise. Uh, bringing down the uh, the techno structure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that's your bio. Um, before we jump into the topics we were discussing before, as is par for the course for Tales from the Crypt, how did you get into all of this? How did you find Iterative? How did you find Bitcoin? How did you end up where you are today? Well, so without without like reciting my whole resume, I can say that the thing that tipped me off to the value of cryptocurrency generally was uh, a consulting project I did for BlackRock in 2013, I would say. So I spent some, some years as a management consultant doing technology strategy for big Fortune 50 companies who were essentially trying to figure out, uh, and a lot of these companies were, were enterprise software companies. They were trying to figure out you know, where the market was going, what, what kind of enterprise software would people be buying in five or 10 years how to how to develop it you know choosing the right technology and then also how to take it to market and build a narrative around it and uh an example of this sort of conceit is the cloud right this term that we we know the mm -hmm. cloud that is the a infamous cloud the infamous cloud that's a completely manufactured uh the narrative of the the migration to the cloud is a completely manufactured narrative brought to you courtesy of ibm microsoft hpe all the usual suspects some great propaganda they pushed out there it is, and it powers a lot of what people think is common knowledge about tech is actually very, very carefully laid uh, marketing narratives for enterprise software. Really? Why, why do you say carefully? Oh, you were, you were in the, uh, the belly of the monster, per se. So Yeah, so the, I think the insight... So the, I probably did the most work with HPE and Hitachi. Um, and the insight there is that technology is agnostic to purpose. So if you... If you want to sell something as being futuristic, you first have to convince people that that is the future, and then you have to introduce your product offering second. What you can't do is say, here's our, our line of cloud, you know, cloud services or cloud servers, and uh, oh, and by the way, like, this is going to be really big. Like, you, you actually have to spend, if you're one of these companies and you're, you're trying to propagate these massive uh, vendor relationships, which are worth hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases, um, and they last for many years, you need to think of what people will consider to be the future in five or ten years now is that actually going to be the future you don't care because you're just trying to sell your your product mm -hmm. so so you're doing this uh and what are your your eye about bitcoin in particular so the project that i did for for blackrock which i think is probably fine to talk about now was a project around uh selling um financial products direct to consumer so like a lot of their competitors, BlackRock sells products through uh, financial advisors and, and people like that. And they'd rather be able to advertise to you 
and have you click directly and buy a, like a retirement product because they know that millennials who will be retiring at some point um, like to buy things digitally. So, and the reason this project went nowhere is because there just was no infrastructure to initiate the transaction and close it like all within the same browser session. You couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so it was just trying to cut out our RIAs or... Uh, not as much RAs. I mean, mm -hmm. for BlackRock in particular, they deal with this this network of freelancers mm -hmm. who kind of get referral fees for selling their products. But the the point here is that in order to have a really lightweight financial transaction that's web based, there is no infrastructure based on Visa or Mastercard that's going to make that easy. Right? You have to pull out the card. You have to pull out the wallet. Um, you know, your physical wallet, and you can't really get over that as a as someone who's trying to sell a digital product. Mm -hmm. And so. Bitcoin basically as that uh, sort of fuel for for those types of products sort of caught your eye. Yeah, I didn't. I wouldn't say that I conceived of a natural solution on the spot, but I thought, I thought, oh, this is why some people that I know in the in the in the engineering world are really excited about Bitcoin because this is kind of the fi the kind of digital native financial infrastructure, and that's as far as I got as of 2013. Yeah, and that's what uh, we've mentioned that mentioned this many times on this podcast but what is it the the 402 error is like the payment payment gateway like they yeah. thought they would have a an innate payments network on the internet when they first built it but just never came to be yes and some would argue that bitcoin is is what they they envisioned or would be yeah. what they envisioned um so you your first step in what if if i recall correctly from our first conversation we met about eight to 12 months ago you started messing around mining correct or yeah, pretty quickly after that, um, well, well, first, so I'll be completely honest because there's, there's no shame in that. Well, first, I, I looked at Bitcoin and I was like, this is really cool, but I'm not a C++ developer. I had always hacked on things that were higher level, newer languages. And uh, like I, I built iPhone apps, um, so I, I was pretty good with Objective-C, but at the time, like I just didn't want to put in the work to learn. It felt old fashioned. Like I didn't get it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I looked at Ethereum and then... Uh, and I thought, oh, this is something that an idiot like me can program, right? Which should have been the first sign. <laughs> it was a bad idea. But, um, <laughs> but I, I, so I started looking into it more. And, at, and at, you know, subsequently, I moved on to another consulting project at Bloomberg, where I was working with the core infrastructure team, helping them recruit young engineers. And their, their, I mean, this is relevant, I promise. Their whole approach to recruiting young engineers, their, their idea, which management didn't love, but, but I did, was... Let's talk about how much free open source software we use. Let's talk about how much we use Apache. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of put these two things together and I thought, oh, there is a need for financial infrastructure, but it needs to be, it needs to be low level. It needs to be really, really competently built and, and architected. Um, and it needs to be free and open source. I mean, like unabashedly free and open source. And already Ethereum was showing signs of commercializing a little prematurely or, or centralizing. And so that's when I kind of, became more enamored of Bitcoin at that point. What necessarily about Ethereum did you find centralizing? Well, I could tell Infura was going to become a problem. Yeah. Like it was it was obvious how quickly the blockchain was growing and um but I, this was all before, you know, the the bubble of 17, so I th sort of thought, "Eh, we got like 5 to 10 years for this thing to slowly smolder." But no. No. Yeah, and that's like Infura is a topic that's been more popular uh in the last month in particular. But is was I would argue sort of under the radar for a while. People don't really realize the the role that they play in the the uh, centralization that they do provide for free Ethereum in particular. I mean, all the major apps that Ethereum users uh, dole over uh, use uh, use Infura as a third party, and then behind that, Infura is using Amazon as a third party at the end of the day right. too. So it's just layers of centralization. You found Bitcoin. How did you come to start Iterative? What, what, when did Iterative come to be? So Iterative was born out of a... Love the name, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Incredible name. As a UX, somebody with UX design experience in the past, uh, like I think uh, Iterative, just the, the concept of iteration and always looking to improve is a great, uh, a great sort of mantra. And I don't know if that's your mantra, but... Yeah, I love absolutely. The yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate it. It is, um, that's how we mean it. Uh, and you know, it's also why our business is always evolving and, you know, the thing we started at, uh, or started as it was, was an MVP of a fund. So the, the idea was at the time, 
when I realized that there was a broader need for like really digital native financial infrastructure, and I started to see all this excitement building up here in New York and other places that I went. Um, so my, my business partner and I decided to leave our respective jobs and launch a fund. And at the time, we were pitching digital infrastructure. And uh, the idea was to do traditional equity investments in companies that were building off of Bitcoin or off of uh, a comparable blockchain, which at the time I thought existed. Now I realize it's basically just Bitcoin. But um, at the time, I thought, oh, there's going to be this litany of different ecosystems, and this is a good place for a kind of a, a new venture fund to play. And then very quickly, we realized that the prices of the assets themselves were growing, and we amended. So we raised our fund. Um, we closed it at the end of, I guess, uh, well, mid-2016, um, or early 2016, I should say. And then we very quickly amended our LPA to be able to just buy Bitcoin, uh, <laughs> and we started doing that. And we returned the fund in February of last year, like at the peak. Well, congrats on that. Great timing there. How hard was Thank it you. to make that amendment? Was it easy? Uh, you know, the writing was on the wall, mm-hmm. and uh, we had one very big office, family office, that was staking most of, of you know, our AUM, so they, they got it, I think, yeah. right away. So you returned that fund, recently raised another fund, correct? Or? Man, now we have like six or seven different investment vehicles. But it was it was after that fund that I realized that the ICO thing was just going nowhere. I mean, we had made most of our money off of just the appreciation of Bitcoin. Um, but there was a period where I was really nervous that the whole token thing would really take off because we weren't pursuing that. We didn't advise projects. We didn't, you know, we didn't actually go on and do any real venture activity. We, we made a couple seed investments, um, but we were not, you know, my, my business partner is, is a former securities lawyer. Um, and so he could see right away that this stuff was going to be problematic for a long time. So that's why we kind of consciously made the decision, uh, I guess in the middle of 2017, early 2017 to get really serious about mining and looking at mining. Yeah. And so what was that like, uh, during that mania sitting on the sidelines being like, oh shit, are you looking back in retrospect? Are you happy that you, uh, that you missed that? Yeah. Because the truth is. Our fund returned something like a twelve x multiple, and you know if we had if we had gone into i c o tokens with more focus, we could have increased that multiple, but we also could have earned a subpoena or any number of other <laughs> obstacles um which a lot of our competitors did get subpoenaed, and we've got you know we got nothing we broke no law so so you know we're we're in it for the long term we want to be around when crypto when bitcoin particularly is very mature, yeah. So I think before we jump into mining in particular, I think it's important to talk about your thesis. So for you freaks out there that don't know, uh, Iterative came out with some of the hottest content uh, in Bitcoin last year with, what was it, 104 pages? Something like that, yeah. When like, the, you look at the draft, it's online. Uh, seven sections of a, of a grand thesis of why uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general are, are probably here to stay and, and, and uh, what people should be looking at. And... You did tell people to avoid ICOs and tokens in particular, but I think what's most important is the fact that you guys dove into the history of m- impor- uh, most importantly free and off open source software and cryptography and sort of uh, documented how those that the technology of cryptography and the movement of free and open source software uh, sort of evolved over the last four decades in particular. So I think uh, it would be... Uh, advantageous for us to sort of jump back to to the history, how things have changed over the last four decades, why you guys decided to go all the way back that far and sort of preface your thesis uh, as a story almost. That, that's what I loved about it. It was like a story. Thanks. Um, as an investment thesis, it was easy to read, to get through, uh, even considering how long it was. So what uh, what was like the brainstorming session like and, and why did you guys decide to go all the way back and then and then frame it this way? Well, it started with um, it started with uh, like just a lot of clues that I had been collecting. I mean, one of the one of the the really um, enlightening moments was when I read some of the the things that the Microsoft folks had said about Linux in the in the early '90s, or excuse me, the late '90s, early 2000s. And and I realized that that they were sh- shockingly similar to the comments that. Um, activist investors were making about Bitcoin. And I thought, well, now I know what it looks like when an empire is threatened. 
you know, mm -hmm. or or is already beaten maybe if you if you're going back to 2000 and, and Linux. So I would say that that was one motivation is that I started to see signs that this that we've seen this before. This has happened before, um, at least in software. And the and the other reason was. I was not satisfied with the narratives that people had put out there about why Bitcoin exists. I just didn't think that it really encompassed uh, the, the real motivation. And um, I'll say two things about that. One is that, uh, you know, in college, like taking computer science and choosing not to be an engineer, I saw a lot of my friends go into engineering and, um, and, it, and I saw it as being a, a kind of high risk decision. In the sense that it, w it it becomes very easy to get locked into an unpleasant role if you're not really really sharp about how you how you pick your jobs mm -hmm. um, or your expertises. I mean, it's it's in it's an interesting gamble. Like if you start if you study certain types of engineering in college, it's possible that type of engineering just becomes irrelevant in ten years, and you now have an expertise that nobody needs. So I was shocked by how careful software engineers had to be, all kinds of engineers, but, but software engineers too, had to be about picking and choosing what they became good at. And I noticed that they had very few reservations about getting good at a framework that was free, open source, and really popular because that was job security. And that you know, goes back to what I was saying about Bloomberg. They were trying to tell young engineers, hey, if you come here, you'll learn Apache frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. And you can go anywhere and do Apache. Um, anybody that's, you know, running a web server is going to, is going to need your help. So, um, so that was a, a big motivation. The other thing is, I think that, I think that it's, it is interesting to talk about central banks and it's inter interesting to talk about how our existing monetary system is sort of a scam perpetrated by people who thought these things up 300 years ago. Uh, however, it's not a very accessible standpoint to look at Bitcoin from and I thought there has to be a way to appeal to the self-interest of normal people who all have jobs and they all go to work and they know what it's like to be stuck in a, in a shitty position or with the wrong skill set or wishing they had done something else career-wise. This is something that everybody can sort of empathize with and I thought that would be a better way into the whole free and open source thing which is surprising and counterintuitive for people who are not from the software world. Why do you think it's so counter counterintuitive? Well, going back to, you know, in the thesis, there's a, a study that I cite from MIT, mm -hmm. um, which I think was done in 2005, and it's about the motivations of people who contribute to free and open source software projects. And the authors the, of the paper say interesting things like, you know, it might defy uh, logic that, that people would act altruistically in sort of a business setting, that they might build something and give it away. If it's worth money, why would you do that? And that... Um, I've sort of taken for granted kind of coming up in the world of tech, but uh, I realized that there was a big disconnect between why a monetary system should be free and open source and what's motivating people to go into, to work on free and open source systems, right? You sort of have to get comfort there before you can move on to Bitcoin as an implementation of a free and open source monetary system. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. No, it is a huge leap. I mean, I was only introduced to like free and open source software after I had left finance dove into UX design and then somehow so I took that UX digital design boot camp worked in UX for a little bit little bit and then I wanted to learn more about the back end I ended up working for the software development company focused on Drupal in particular which is not the 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 sexiest uh, it's not definitely not the sexiest technology but it is an open source community so I learned a lot about the lamp stack yep. uh, and sort of the ethos behind open source just by getting thrown into it for two and a half years and yep. it really wasn't until you experienced like oh now i get it like this is this makes sense like that yeah. if you build tools uh that you then give away like your tool could become more powerful and everybody's combination of building these these tools together just makes the the system that much more powerful there's so much more leverage you can get by sharing it right and you would never appreciate all that if you don't start out appreciating how difficult it is to build software and how, how redundant a lot mm -hmm. of the software in the world is and how, how desperate people are to share infrastructure if they can do it in a way that doesn't put them strategically at risk. That's, that's you know, the car companies do it with, um, with their replacement parts. They, they standardize. This is the ISO system. This mm -hmm. is most of the industrial world is standardizing around the size of brake rotors and the, you know, all these things because otherwise supply chain management becomes a complete nightmare. So, um, but you know, it's a lot of context for, for somebody that doesn't, doesn't have a window in from one of those worlds. How are you supposed to get Bitcoin? You know? Right. Yeah. 
and that, and it, and it's a it's crazy because that's like you touched on your thesis. It's been a forty year process. So like going back, let's talk about how different the engineering culture is now in a, in a corporate environment. Like now, the engineers are, are running uh, running the show. Like yeah. they they have the most leverage as opposed to. 40, 50 years ago, and that was not the case where the, the, the leaders of the hierarchy sort of dictated down. Now we're at a point, especially it's probably taken a generation, a few decades for people, engineers specifically to realize like, wait a second, like I have the leverage here. Like, yeah, I'm making this happen. And yeah. There's sort of been that revolution yep. and more and more people are waking up to it. Um, but it is, uh, it is a very different mindset than, than what the world was used to for so long. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and that's just the engineering mindset. I mean, you brought up a good kind of ancillary topic, which is that there is a, that tech itself, which used to be, you know, engineering dominated, obviously, um, and, and used to be very focused on planning. You know, if you go back like 25 years or 30 years, if you built a piece of software, it was planned from soup to nuts, like five years ahead of time. And waterfall, it, baby. Waterfall, exactly, exactly. So, so the, the whole birth of the agile movement and, um, which I think actually comes from manufacturing, right? Like the whole just-in-time concept that Toyota developed in the 80s for making really, really lean manufacturing processes. That that kind of bled out into information manufacturing, if you could call it that. And people started to think, well, let's just see how far we can get by whipping things together and then iterating. And that that's a design that's design thinking. Like if you talk to anybody that's that's an architect or um, or an artist, I guess, if they're trained, then then they're they're taking a specific approach to conceptualizing the problem, building a, a solution or something that they think sends the right message towards a solution, and then it's this reflexive process where you, as the as your understanding of the problem improves, your product improves, and it's that's really easy to understand when you pick up, you know, like this bottle or or any number of ergonomically designed things in this room, right? You can see it because industrial designers have become so good at their craft, but. Um, in software, that's still a fairly new thing that we only really got like in the mid 2000s with Airbnb, businesses like Airbnb, which was founded by two designers who basically said, hey, we think we can merchandise people's homes the way that, ho you know, Marriott merchandises hotel rooms if we just send a really good photographer. <laughs> right? No, think about how unlikely of a pitch that is if you come from an engineering mindset and you're like, no, 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 this is all about price matching and search and discovery. And these guys basically said, no, it's about painting a picture of your destination and selling that. That's a very underrated concept, I think, is that you can design anything. Everybody thinks you can design anything. You can design processes. You can design your day. You can design this podcast is designed in a certain way. Like People yeah. don't realize that you can apply design thinking to every aspect of your life. And I was just thinking that at the end of the like, keep harping on UX, but like harping on UX, like at the end of the day and making it a pun intended iterative process, uh, like quick iterations in particular yep. is, is why Airbnb was able to get to the level they are. And which should be crazy important to include in this diatribe we're going off on right now, or this tangent we're going off on right now is that the free and open source software movement in particular, and then just the software movement in general is, is driven the p cost of production to such a point where you can get two minds f in the case of Airbnb, four minds in the case of Instagram and build a fucking multi-billion dollar business. Right. Which is insane. And, and which is insane. And people still don't get that concept either because it's what we we're talking about right before we hit record. And I told you to stop talking. I want to talk about it now is like the concept of the work week and, and, and we are stuck in this hell as a society stuck in this, this this structure and this form of the industrial age and literally people can't break out people are still working in cubes yeah all over the world and it it just is not necessary with the technology that that exists today i would argue but you have some strong thoughts about that as well yeah absolutely i, I mean i think that i think that everything that we've learned about design in the last 20 years from from, from not just industrial design but but software design and the way that software has kind of wormed its way into every aspect of our lives. If we, if we now understand that the best, the best way to solve a problem is iteratively, what are we all doing picking our careers when we're 21? Right. right. That, that something about that doesn't make sense. And there is not a socially acceptable way to kind of just fuck around for a while and figure out, learn some skills, figure out where you want to apply them. Right. The world is very, very unwelcoming to that approach to life. And uh, that's why I am sympathetic to 
the generation of freelancers that has popped up, right? There, there's a whole, I mean, many of them are living in this neighborhood around us. This is, this is the, the neighbor, Williamsburg is the neighborhood that freelancing built, I think. The Mecca. The, the Mecca of the freelance <laughs> lifestyle. And obviously there's a ton of bullshit associated with this, right? There's a ton yeah. of people that like essentially live off, the, I assume, live off their parents if they're paying their rents. In this neighborhood, they don't have jobs. They work when they like, and I'm not talking about that. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about people who can see that locking themselves into a corporate gig, whatever their skill set is, whether it's tech, design, you know, marketing, uh, any, literally anything, um, they see that they are better off developing their skill set and dealing on a client basis with people. And I love this because it gives people repetitions with different employers in a very short amount of time. Granted, if you do it wrong, like I said, you may learn nothing and just ultimately end up broke. But um, I think you can make progress a lot faster as a highly motivated, ambitious freelancer than you can as an entry-level employee. I would completely agree. And I wouldn't consider myself a freelancer at all, but I would say I did buck the trend a little bit in my early to mid 20s and I was sitting in a very cushy job working at a futures fund in Chicago had a very good career trajectory so I kept on it and I literally just viscerally could not take sitting in a cube from 6 30 a.m to 5 p.m every day oh it's deadly it is deadly and uh, I've been on a journey since then I would argue I'm still on the journey still don't know exactly what I'm gonna do but it has been an iterative process I went to UX design and back-end development and went to Barstool to figure out how to do podcasting and media and shit like that. And now, hopefully, I'm, I'm in the process of building my own thing, but it has been a shit. I quit in 2014, the summer of 2014. So it's been a five, almost five-year journey. Um, That's excellent. But I want to change it. I mean, I did not make as much money as I could have if I stayed in that job, but I wouldn't change it for the world at all. But I, I do think there is that social pressure. Just like I got a lot of shit from my parents i'd be like no i don't want to do this i'm sorry like i'm out i know you guys are worried but this is what i need to fucking do but yeah. there is that that social pressure there and a lot of people get stuck man you talk to people they're like how'd you do it it's like it wasn't easy man that that summer i took that ux boot camp i lived off a chipotle bowl and a <laughs> small like grande starbucks coffee a day i was poor as fuck yeah there's pictures like i slept on I was a 23 year old sleeping on a sophomore in college's like couch for the summer. I got skinny as fuck, but it was the funnest scum- summer of my life. Like, yeah. I felt free. It was yeah. like, holy shit, I'm learning something new. And that's the other thing. If you get stuck in a job, you're not always learning. You get stuck in a, in a rote script and you don't learn new things. Yeah. And that, that, I think that's what drove me crazy. Yeah. Like, it well, was just, yeah. You become used to clocking out at, you know, five or six and not thinking about your work. And, and actually, you know, <clears throat> I have a lot of respect for people who take the approach that work is not their identity. Like I, I think that I actually, that this is a, a sort of circular continuum that um, you can become so involved in your work that you can't talk about anything else. Right. Sometimes I'm afraid I'm one of those people. And, uh, I, and I know how kind of deadly boring that is. Like if you get stuck with, next to one of these people at a dinner party and it's like, geez, this guy just wants to talk about maritime law or something you know what i mean mm-hmm. and it's like nobody else cares so there there is a so i i can appreciate the the attitude that like you know what i am who i am from nine to five and then i'm going to be who, whoever else i want from from five to nine like i that that's a that's a reality that i that i like i prefer that and that's why i sort of think if you can get to a point where your work is just a set of skills and all of your other time is spent building up a personality and being the person you want to be, you can sort of merge those. And um, and right now we don't have a lot of good examples of that because so much work is corporate and people instinctively don't get too dedicated to corporate jobs, right? Because it's a corporations are, are by nature a tragedy of the commons. Like nobody gives a shit. They, like everybody is just showing up. I mean, I'm, I shouldn't be too cynical, but it's not like any one person. I don't think you're being too cynical. I think you're being very descriptive. Well, I guess I, it's not that these people don't work hard and they're not driven. It's just that it's not their company. It's not their baby, right? And I'm not saying that you should always work on your baby. You should have a little distance. However, um, when something is yours, you get all of the credit for when it succeeds. And that makes you behave differently. It makes you, I think, work harder. And, uh, and doing that outside the corporate system without all the support and the, and the infrastructure that corporations provide is especially admirable. And, it's, and you get especially rewarded for that. So... I see, I see Bitcoin as infrastructure for a transition period where 
we're not all earning money in the same exact way. We're not all getting direct deposit every two weeks. That requires a little flexibility. That requires a financial system with a little flexibility. Maybe some of us are selling things directly. Maybe some of us are selling services. Maybe some of us are selling data for, for you know, amounts that are too small for Visa or MasterCard. It's really about uh, a broadening of, of use cases and a long tail of transactions that just are not supported by you know, the, the, the narrow band of payment rails that we have today. Yeah, maybe you're selling podcast ads or something like that. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly. actually, no, but I'm happy you, uh, you mentioned that small amounts of data. It's a tangent, but I uh, love that, uh, that newsletter on uh, using Lightning to sell, to sell small amounts of data. Was that yesterday? That today? was yesterday, yeah. yeah. So if, if, if scam artists are doing this, right, they're selling pers- oh, personal God. data for 10 cents per record, yeah, but, so they, but they have to sell it in bulk in $10 blocks because presumably... I mean, they must not be using Bitcoin. I don't know what they're using. That article didn't mention it. It didn't link to the the, the dark market, the dark, the dark market site. But um, yeah, I mean, it, that's always how it starts. It always starts. Yeah. So, for you freaks that don't know, a bunch of uh, Bitcoin exchanges got hacked. Matt and I, will, Matt and Odell and I, will probably talk about this tomorrow, Friday, on Rabbit Hole Recap. I'm going to text my wife to tell her to bring some more bourbon. Um, but yeah, a bunch of Bitcoin exchanges and altcoin exchanges got. Uh, their KYC server, or I don't know if there's a KYC service, they got hacked and a bunch of people's personal data is out there, like passport pictures and internet, and it's being sold on the dark web for like 10 bucks a pop for all the data. That's the real exchange exit scam right there. Right? <laughs> yeah. You can't stage a hack, just sell all, <laughs> sell all the user's data. data. Hey, you want some passports? And <sighs> Who doesn't? <laughs> right? Yeah. But I mean, I mean, and that's a whole other tangent is like the whole KYC AML thing. It's a fucking, it's a fucking ruse. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm a little drunk here. I'm bourbon already. I haven't <laughs> drank in like three days, so I got a tolerance. I have my tolerance <laughs> right now. But um, the KYC AML, like today, just came out the Deutsche Bank and Bank, uh, what was it, Bank Danky, were laundering hundreds of billions of dollars. Slap on the wrist, like they just got oh, slip up. Really, they're criminals, and yeah. these KYC AML laws exist to stop these people from under, like money laundering. But really, what it does is just put a burden on small businesses and the little man, and the people at the top just launder the money anyway through traditional banking systems. So yeah. it's all bullshit on its face, and then it makes everybody worse off because you have that data out there, and now fucking people's passport information out there, people's identities are going to be stolen because of the need to collect this data to trade to trade funny internet money (laughs) people are going to take this risk let them like yeah and the worst part about this is that this system is is uh it's completely avoidable if you are rich enough Um, right and you know like the i don't know if you've ever looked into the the british um the offshore trust system but the the reason that the the reason that the that the government of Great Britain is so eager, and the government of the United States too, is so eager to suppress and eliminate Swiss banking secrecy is because they have this whole alternate system of anonymous trusts, which are generally based out of Grand Cayman or another British kind of offshore. Um, Caymans usually. Yeah, or Jersey Isles or uh, Guernsey or th- there's a, a bunch of them, Malta. Um Although Malta, I think, is not a British property, but but whatever. It's you know the fact remains. Like, if you have enough capital, you can basically hand it over to a trustee, and there is no qualification for being a trustee. There is no central database of trustees. There are no reporting requirements for trustees. It is like, I mean, it's it's actually completely amazing if you are if you're in the position to avail yourself of it. But um, it is certainly not fair and. I don't know if every system necessarily needs to be fair. However, uh, that's actually an interesting point I want to touch on after this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, this thought's probably not going anywhere, but all, but all I can think is like, if centralization of liquidity provides more credit to a system, like if you don't have liquidity hiding in little pockets, hiding from regulation or tax in little pockets. More credit in the sense of debt or like credit in the sense of stature? Credit in the sense of debt. Okay. Um, and this this may be an idiot thought that you're going to have to edit out later, but I would think that you no would edits. want, I would think that you would want a system where all the liquidity is addressable, right? So it's it's great to have a limited issuance of of coins, 
but ideally you'd be able to address coin holders or at least have them connected to some system ah, this is an idiot thought <laughs> but but um my my point is like some of that capital which is locked up in trusts which by definition can't move is not being lent out right so it's not being it's not being deployed as venture capital mm-hmm. it's not bearing interest uh it's not really doing anybody any favors it's just hanging out and it's somebody's rainy day fund and um and i think that in a macro sense everybody would be better off in a system where it's it's not so necessary to hide liquidity and it's not it's not so common to hide liquidity yeah right but like why why are people forced to to use these offshore trusts that's the other thing it's like it's it's all because there's no pseudonymity with the actual asset right and if there was again i ha- you know i haven't thought this through until just now but if there was i would think that people would be if they could invest pseudonymously or they could lend pseudonymously in a global market without any particular regulator having jurisdiction which is sort of where i picture bitcoin going i i I picture it as an international unstoppable global market for stuff where um probably not physical stuff because that gets you into you know jurisdictional issues but but information and um and financial transactions, if it becomes like a, a global kind of supranational network for moving liquidity around so that people can, you know, buy and invest in different places, that I think means that the system becomes more meritocratic because even it's, even an idea that's not politically popular or an idea that is ahead of its time will find someone globally who is willing to invest. And so essentially it's an information problem that, that today the markets are balkanized and, uh, not only an information problem, but a flow of information problem, right? Right. It's, uh, and I, I mean, and this has been another big topic in the news of Bitcoin recently is the deplatforming leading people to Bitcoin, but it is, uh, it is there for these people, right? It is a form of free speech at the end of the day, if you will. It, it, it is, is f- many things. It is sound right. money. It is free speech. It is, uh, code it is many things at once, but incredible things that I, I think you and I would agree humanity needs, particularly at this point in time where I've actually been having more and more conversations. I think as a society, we're losing touch with reality. And I think when Safi Dean in the Bitcoin standard says that Bitcoin is the only set of objective truths in the universe, <laughs> potentially, <laughs> at least Earth, we know, as, uh, f- to be certain, like, there is this need for society in my mind. I, I don't know if I'm getting too cosmic here, but I do feel like we're getting de- more further and further detached from reality. And I would argue that uh, the core of that problem is money creation and Bitcoin can help us get, get more anchored into reality. Um, just from having a, a literally a, a truth machine, like, hey, this is what happened in the last 10 minutes. Here's, here's the block to prove it. We spend a lot of energy and money um, to prove what, the transactions that happen and throughout time. Um, so that's, that's another thing that drives me to Bitcoin is like the, the, the search for objective, undeniable truth. I don't know yeah. if I just got too cosmic there. No, that's, that's, um, that's very enlightenment of you. <laughs> but I, I think that, I think that is, uh, that is at the core, of a lot of, a lot of this stuff. And I think, um, the counter argument is that, well, if, anybody can if anybody can and this is also a counter argument to free speech but if anybody can spend their money pseudonymously and invest in things you know while obviating a regulator or or a supervisor then surely people will fund all kinds of terrorist groups right that's the natural counter argument however if you look at like who bankrolled the third reich it was a union bank here in New York, right? It was Prescott Bush, George W. Bush's grandfather. It was the Warburgs. It was who took all the the gold from the Czech Republic and <laughs> gave it to the Nazis, the BIS. Like, yeah, it's, like, it's all the same clowns. It just so happens that they they get their own secret system, right? The system essentially works for them, and you know, I think everybody knows this on a certain level, but I don't think that people who haven't read history realize how acutely well understood this scam is i mean banking is just it's a it's an outfit it's a it's a racket for international families to push politics around 
and uh, there are so many warning signs throughout history. I don't I don't care who writes the laws. Give me the power to create money, and I'll like that's all that. Yeah, matters. that's that's Mayor Rothschild, right? That yeah. said that I think. Yeah. yeah, and then you have Andrew Jackson and Thomas Jefferson, like. Oh, warning man. about uh, banking and, yeah, and I love, money I love creation. Jackson was not an educated guy. That was his whole shtick, right? And even he knew to kill the bank. Shout out Jackson, the last the last man to bring down a central bank in America. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, thank joke. God we had him. Uh, there, there was one, there was believe it or not, there was a central bank before uh, the central bank that we have now in the states, the Federal Reserve. What was the first Federal Reserve Bank? The Federal Reserve Bank we're on now is number two. Andrew number Jackson. three. Number three? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So was... Hamilton created one that, that mm-hmm. was put down, I think, by the revolution of 1802 yep. with yep. Jefferson when mm-hmm. he was elected. Yeah. Um, I could be botching the history, but uh, but but yeah, the, th- the third one was the one that Jackson took down. and They shot him like three times. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you, <laughs> he when was you... involved in like five duels, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean also assassination attempts. I think he died with like two two bullets in him from... Um, from people who were known to be agents of, of offshore banks. Yeah. And the Europeans have constantly been trying to, I mean, now they've succeeded, but since 1913. But uh, they've always been trying to insinuate their banking system into the U.S. And, yeah. No, and that's, how do we, how do we like, sh- I don't want to say shake people up, but like wake people up to, like I want to grab people to like, wake up. Like this is, it's an anomaly, like the way our money is currently run as an anomaly in the course of human history. And people are like, oh, people like to say, ah, oh, the, the technology and the civilization that we're hands to today is because of this monetary policy, where I would argue it's because in spite of that monetary policy, but people, yeah, people are addicted to it, man. And it's getting, it's getting weird around the world. Like today, Venezuela official coup. It looks like the U S is trying to take over another country. <laughs> just, just endorsed another, another president and, some some dilapidated nation around the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd love to see Maduro get taken down, but I, I don't know if I feel comfortable about Trump being like, this guy's the president now. Um, yeah, I know. Th- that's where that's where the political spectrum becomes kind of a horseshoe for me, where, uh, and I got to like tread carefully with, with anything political, but, um, but I, I would say that this, the scam of central banking has been, well, this, the scam of, I shouldn't say central bank, the scam of fiat currency that people quantitatively ease forever is a really well understood phenomenon. The first idiot to, um, to propose this was John Law, who became the finance minister of France in like 1725. And mm-hmm. by 1789, they were in full scale revolution, <laughs> cutting people's heads off because his whole approach was like, let's just issue paper money and we just keep printing it. And, he had kind of a wait and see approach. He's very iterative, that guy. <laughs> he had a wait and see <laughs> approach um, to like, what's, well, let's see what happens if we just go to a paper money standard and then just print money. Uh, Edward Chancellor, is, the author, is a great um, recounter of that whole episode of history. But, uh, but then we also have the Weimar Republic, which, ended, which landed the German Empire in World War I. And then we also have uh, Japan in the 1930s, which landed Japan in World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, and what always, it always happens the same way. It's the military is the, is, the, is the one you can't say no to. The central bank or the government or whoever, whoever the, fe- the treasury, whoever's in charge of that country's money printing, they are good at austerity except with the military. And that's why these things commonly end in war because the military is just building and buying whatever it wants. Well, I mean, and this is a problem going back to fucking ancient Rome. That's why the Roman Empire fucking fell. They spread their army fucking too far out. They... To base their currency was all tung sold. What, what is it? Uh, tung sold, or uh, where you just put bunk metals in gold? What's it called? Tungsten. 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 Yeah. Tungsten. Yeah. yeah. They, they just it wound up like the, the soldiers thought they were getting gold. They were getting tungsten, and then the, literally the drive to pay their soldiers to base their money so much that Rome was sacked within like Rome went from like four million people to like forty thousand in two years or something like that. Yeah. There's also a, an interesting argument by uh, a professor at Oxford, I think whose name is Joseph Tainter, if I, if I have that right, um, who basically said that, that, that Rome fell because it ran out of people. Because culturally, it was popular for Romans to move to the furthest flung new conquered territory. Mm-hmm. And that the city of Rome was becoming so expensive and so um, devoid of working age people that, that eventually the bureaucracy sort of collapsed under the weight of its own expenses. Um, 
but you know uh, to your point like all this comes back to currency and paying people and people clipping coins right once the currency is in, in the wild it, it, any anything can happen to it um so you know it's it's about time that people had a, a conscious conversation about the fact that we are living in a money bubble and uh and the money bubble continues to inflate other little niche bubbles like mm-hmm. real estate or like equities or that's what like people are like where's the inflation after after quantitative easing it's like have you looked at equities markets like have you looked at housing markets have you looked at education like Right, it, it comes out in asset prices. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a thing. I think probably a lot of Austrians, libertarians, or whatever, were probably wrong in thinking uh, when QE was initiated. Originally, that would cro- cause price inflation. I mean, uh, cause inflation of the dollar in particular, but really it caused price inflation in financial assets. Um, yeah, and that's why we're at the levels we are today. And that's what people don't realize. Like. How can you honestly, 10 years back, a 10-year retrospective, going back to 08, how can you honestly like, look people in the face, say yeah, our economy is better off, our economy is better off, but 60% of people can't afford a $400 emergency. Like, Don't worry about it. Healthcare is very expensive. Like, And if you don't sign up for the government healthcare, we're going to fine you but two grand. Um, oh, shared responsibility, my ass. Yeah. <laughs> That was like me. What like a, when I was struggling <laughs> through my iterative process to find out like the path I was going on, like I was unemployed a lot and yeah. I was learning a lot and my I was on all my parents' health insurance, wasn't on my wife's health insurance. I was fucking un, 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 uninsured for like two or three years. Yeah. And I got fucking fined two times. Yeah. I had to, like I was struggling and down, like I was willing to take the risk of not having health care, but yet I had to pay two grand, I had to come up with two grand two years in a row to pay that fucking tax. Like it doesn't make any fucking sense. So you're taxing poor people there like these this this inflation is seeing like and that's the that's the crazy insidious part about it is that the inflation makes people wealthy on paper but they're able to leverage that paper wealth to fucking loot the world <laughs> yeah that that is <laughs> i was gonna say like that the the counterpoint to all, all the central bank inflation is that well we get to finance all of this amazing r d that we do for cancer drugs and for iphones and yeah that's the know, argument satellites. that this monetary policy gave us this world it's bullshit it, it is it's bullshit because at the end of the day this stuff is only available to you if you have money to buy it with and if your money is constantly losing purchasing power yeah. then these things are increasingly not available to you. So yeah, they're collateralized I'm, by equities or uh, portfolios, whatever you have. Like, Yeah, it is it is still a, a redistribution of wealth in, in the wrong direction, um, you know, upwards. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to think of a way out of this at this point. Um, right? Even with Bitcoin, it's still, like, heavy. It's like, I don't think you could... It's not going to be an easy transition, Ooh, even with Bitcoin. Yeah, it's not going to be pretty. No, I mean, I like, I am, I am so sympathetic to the idea that we could have a debt jubilee, but it's so idealistic. You know, the idea oh, that yeah. that the entire that our entire generation of millennials would just opt out of the existing financial system, and that that doesn't create just catastrophic problems for other people. people. Right? Yeah. Like, that's not. not it's realistic. a pipe dream. That's why I actually had a. Uh, Bitcoin Tina on last week and he was saying the most bullish case for the world is a stagnant stock account or stock market for like a decade while Bitcoin's like getting built out like uh, no returns for a decade and that liquidity just moves into Bitcoin or something that would be like the the most optimistic case for a smooth transition or something like that yeah but I don't think it ha- it can happen at this point because ever since Greenspan all of our Fed chairmen have it in their heads that that their job is to create great conditions, great economic conditions. It's not right. This is a far cry from like the policies of Paul Volcker, which is like we need to take strong medicine to get rid of you know, we need, a strong bout of inflation. We right? need somebody to clone Paul Volcker and bring him back. I, is he still alive? I think, I think he, he is. He's like 96. Uh, I'm over here leaning over my laptop because I'm looking for a quote. Um, I believe Justin Moon. Shout out Justin Moon at Bill Boot Camp. Check it out. Um, he tweeted something earlier. It was a quote. Let me find it. Um, right in this vein, though. Where the hell? Come on. Come on. I should have had this up ready to go. It's the thing about, uh, I'll cut this out. Where are we? 4820. How long ago did he tweet this? 
Maybe I just liked it. It was a Thomas Sowell quote. Um, yeah, so Thomas Sowell's great. He's got some real zingers. No, but it's basically like economics. The study of economics should be like you're observing emergent properties. You're not. Pred- it's not predictive. It's descriptive of of things that emerge, and that's the problem with the the central bankers that run our world. They try to predict what's going to happen when really economics should be a, a a retrospective analysis of what what did happen. Right. Economics is the study of. I mean, it, human it, decisions at the end of the day. Yeah. It, it's it is. It is that at the very at the most abstract, but it is also I mean what's interesting to economists is people at the margins, his behavior at the margins. It's not status quo behavior, and um, one of the interesting things about the fi- you know the financial system that we're in today is, and this this comes from uh, Timothy Geithner who wrote a, a piece in Foreign Affairs last year that was really shocking, where he said that we did it wrong after the 2008 collapse. He basically said. We put in place too many capital requirements for correspondent banks, and we now have a situation where the requirements for collateral and for liquidity held on balance sheets is so high that that the system has become more fragile than it was pre-2008. And after I read that, I, I couldn't help but think, like... Such bullshit. It, it, gee, this guy seems n- not very... Uh, conciliatory <laughs> about the fact that oh did we did we tune up the economy in the wrong direction when it broke down like that that seems like a major bonehead move um so you know every attempt my, my point is that every attempt to improve things seems to actually just serve to enforce the status quo which to your point is the opposite of what you want in an economic system you want an economic system that is accommodating of emergent trends right not not a system that is trying to suppress growth where it doesn't expect it or, yeah. or whatever it's almost like a ludic fallacy yeah exactly and and we're having this conversation as as a bunch of the people that's quote unquote saved the economy in 2008 are meeting in davos right now <laughs> if you want to if you want a list of people that destroyed the world like look at who's in davos right now these are people completely disconnected from everyday people in the world like me and you and like i Fucking selling like sixty eight dollar hot dogs, like and yeah. they're and they're it's like the world eco- the world economic forum. They they present themselves as something out to save humanity, yet to to be in on the club, you have to fucking fly to Davos, Switzerland. Switzerland, the most expensive country in the world, you have to spend thousands of dollars on a hotel room, tens of thousands potentially, thousands tens of thousands on ticket number two, number one, and then you literally go and it's a bunch of rich people disconnected with the world trying to dictate how the world works and they're comp- it's it blows my mind that that is actually still palatable and the people that show up to davos in switzerland actually think they're helping the world when especially in the last five to ten years davos has gotten a pretty bad rap i i don't think that they think that they're helping the world no i think that they i think that people the sort of folks that attend davos are very much informed about the fact that they are part of one class and that everyone else is part of another class, and that their agenda serves them and and only has secondary impacts on everybody else. I, I don't think they they fool themselves. I mean, when they talk to press, they, they talk about... They, they paint a much more, um, you know, magnanimous picture, but I, I think that they know exactly what they're doing. But it seems as though, like, everybody... I mean, we're talking a lot about, like, the, the cube working environment and getting stuck in a rut and picking your career straight out of the gate, but it seems like a lot of people stuck in that rut, like, look up these people's idols, and it's, it's once you, so I think that's what, what it was for me early on, luckily, like, where I worked for a fund of funds, a very small boutique hedge fund, a very, very respected president who brought in a lot of money, and so fund of funds may not be the best structure, a 40 act fund, there's a lot of fees but it was great for me because literally my job, we were indexing other managed futures funds into an index product. Mm-hmm. So across four or five products, we probably had 21 managers. So I got to speak and meet with 21 managed futures, uh, chief investment officers, like monthly, quarterly, mm-hmm. yearly, like having calls with them. And when I realized, I was like, holy shit, like 
a lot of these billionaires that I'm talking to, like, aren't that much smarter than me. Like, they don't really know what's going on. They may have just gotten lucky. And, like, once I realized that at, like, 22, 23, I was like, holy fuck. Like, yeah. the, that's, like, a lot of people are stuck in that, oh, I don't know any better than this guy. This guy's a billionaire. He must be the smartest person in the world. And then once you sit there, you're like, holy shit. Like, you have no idea what's going on. And then that was, like, an aha moment for me. I was like, all right, there's something, there's, there's something going on in this world. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the ruse. That's the ruse of being uh <laughs> quote unquote elite, right? Is that you purport to be some something better than human. You mm-hmm. purport to be something that is more than like everybody else is walking around, but you know in your heart that you're just some guy. <laughs> right? right? And and the whole and the whole payoff of being at that level is being some guy and being treated like you're so much more. <laughs> right? And, and right. like, you, what's funny is that you don't have to spend a lot of time with people who got famous young before you, you, you get this vibe like very, very quickly. And um, because they know, right? Like it, they didn't really do everything that, that is required to deserve whatever. But, but right place, right time, uh, not to take away from the individual, right action, right choice, right thing to say. Yeah. Sure, it's all important, but at the end of the day, the impact is so much greater than than any of these people probably ever anticipates. Yeah, it's not like they hold secrets in their mind that, that are unattainable to you. That's what I think a lot of people sort of have blinders on. They're like, ah, that could never be me. It's right, like, ah. it's not a difference in intelligence. It's not a difference in... There's actually not a lot of differences except motivation, attitude, approach. I mean, I... So many business meetings, I think, come down to, like, who is willing to say the uncomfortable thing that needs to be said, right? So if you're negotiating and you know that there's something in the negotiation that isn't serving your purposes, how do you bring that up? And then how do you bring it up in a way that positions you to push the negotiation more in your favor? That, you know, if anything, it's it's a negotiating uh it's a negotiating skill set and not not raw intelligence it's not even you know what family you were born into if if you're if you're more intrepid than the other guy you're going to win every time uh and that that is a matter of attitude and and discipline and things that are mostly internally held i think yeah no and i think i think it's important to make more people aware of this like you i don't want to say fake it till you make it but like there is some credence in that like you can you can present a confident face and people people will think that that you are able to back up that confidence and a lot of the it's a lot it's a, it's a big bluff i don't want to say a bluffing game obviously there's a lot of smart people who got to where they are because they're very smart and very strategic but it's not as it's these people are are not the pedestal that you put them on is not as high as it should be that's what i would say and certainly not if they if they got there by playing the corporate game like there's a there's a lot of people who have titles that belie their actual skill sets and it's because they've just been climbing the corporate ladder using essentially social proof and and kind of other tricks um to get their way to a position that sounds like it is you know much bigger than it really is and that's what it's one of the reasons that i am so uh insistent on destroying the techno structure and kind of destroying the corporate um the 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 corporate apparatus which presupposes a lot and delivers very little you know right and that's all right let's bring it back to bitcoin we'll talk about bitcoin in like 30 minutes this is great but bring it back to bitcoin that's why i'm drawn to bitcoin i would imagine you are as well because it is such a meritocracy and you have anonymous people writing things online and the the cream is just rising to the top based on what people say and there's some people who are not anonymous some people that are but i think this is like uh, the corporate types got blown out between 2013 and 2017. Like all the hashtag blockchain experts and people with very print and proper headshots and their and their uh, avatars, like have their suit and tie, look sharp as hell. Look like they could sell you a great mutual fund. But in Bitcoin, <laughs> that doesn't mean shit. Like unless you're providing good content or good ideas, like you're gonna get shot down. Yeah, and absolutely. I think that's I, that's what draws me. It's like all right, there's no bullshit here. Like bullshit gets called out immediately and there's something like invigorating about that that's i always feel intellectually curious and driven in this space which i think is imperative and again again, going back to like if you pick your career out of college and you're sitting in that cube and that's your career for the next 30 years you're not going to learn like again this is an expanding universe bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general we're literally 
figuring out the boundaries of these systems every day as they're used more and more like that's what drives me intellectually it's like all right what's going on now like we're learning new learning something new there's potential this information is new to the whole market there's potential i could understand it before a lot of other people and there's something vastly exciting about that yeah absolutely it it's uh and what draws me to bitcoin is is the opportunity to be to delay gratification on an insanely long time scale right that, that's actually that's if anything that is the thing that i felt like i was missing growing up and that i think a lot of people you know who were born in the 80s and 90s were missing is that the, you know the 80s and 90s were a go go time of short termism and that if you're growing up in that time like you can't help but absorb some of that that it's all about fast money and um not even fast money fast interactions fast fast um like if you're posting a picture on social media on instagram fast satisfaction like that's it's like you want that instant 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 and there's crazy stats coming out well, we focus on social media in particular right now but like this high time for pre- preference mentality that our society is stuck in and again mm-hmm. like i think our society is disconnected from reality and it's driven uh i would argue by easy money policy which has led to a society of conspicuous consumption which where you think on a month-to-month quarterly to quarterly basis instead of building years in advance and there's stats coming out since the dawn of social media in particular there's a joe rogan episode last week or two weeks ago i forget the dude's name bill biked or something like that but he like dove into the data of middle schoolers like over the last 10 years and suicide rates in particular and the the emergence and proliferation of social media has driven this like high time preference society where I I was at my sister in law's house uh, earlier this week and she was telling us a story if she has a daughter in middle school or her she's got a friend who has a daughter in middle school who like they have to like in middle school now like girls in particular it's it's worse for girls than it is for guys like we're lucky there were guys we're like meatheads like girls have like a terrible cases of FOMO in particular. Yeah. And like in middle school right now, like girl, like this is just anecdotally, but this one particular girl that my sister-in-law knows, like if she does not post a picture and get a certain amount of likes the day before she goes to class, like she will not be talked to in the lunchroom. Like yeah. that is that high time preference. Like, what are you doing for me now? Like right. I'm immaculated, like out to a social aspect instead of like a, a financial aspect. Isn't it funny how high time preference reduces everybody's base level of humanity? Right? That when when That's you That's what I'm getting back to like we're disconnected yes. from reality. In a high time preference world, it's what have you done for me lately? Yeah. Right? It's like who were you today? It doesn't matter who you were yesterday, fuck that. Right? right? Uh that creates I mean especially for a child which by nature children accomplish nothing, right? Their 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 purpose in life until they're 18 or whatever is to just play around. And right. like learn about the world, and then you you put that person in a in an environment where they need to deliver something <laughs> before they are considered legitimate, right? They're going to grow up with a sense that they don't belong to the human race unless they produce a certain amount of reaction with their peers. And the the truth is that some people are really good at that intuitively. By the time they're like seven, they know how to be a ham. But a lot of people take, uh, and I think there's research on this a lot of people take their whole lives to deliver something worthwhile to humanity there are people that literally work i mean you know jeff bezos is is sort of an example where i don't know if he was famous in the world of hedge funds when he was 30 but i doubt it i doubt it right he was a rank and file guy at de shaw but he worked for like 25 years to put together a vision and now by the time he's in his i don't know how old he is 50 or 60 he's delivered something to humanity and um there are some people like him that take their whole lives, and there are some people that, by virtue of their uh, precociousness, can crap out something amazing by the time they're in their 30s, like Einstein or, or whoever else. But, but we cut that opportunity off if we bring people up in a high time preference environment, I think. Yeah, and it's, it's scary, man, because it's, particularly with social media, like because it's so new. Like, it's just as old as Bitcoin. Like, Facebook was, what, 2006? 2004 maybe yeah like it wasn't available to high schoolers till 2006 7 at least it was dot edu up until that point but like we do not like these high time preference social media platforms in particular they are creating uh an environment and again girls in particular like guys just use it to make fun of each other and just do meathead shit but girls in particular it's creating like a, a a fucking environment of fomo and if you look at the data like 
in middle school in particular, it was like this, this is happening to people whose brains aren't fully formed. Like in, and they're saying in high schoolers, it's not as pronounced, but like if your child has a phone between sixth and eighth grade and have access to social media, like the data is like the data of self harm and suicide attempts is, is, is raising at like a hockey stick pace, which is scary. And I, w- I would argue that it does revolve back to high time preference, like high, high time preference money creation number one like in- incentivizing all this and then uh individuals not having the low time preference to, to plan for the future and and yeah well f- i mean imagine if you're a parent and you go deeply into debt to send your kid to college you would of course prefer that kid gets out of school and gets a really high paying job right off the bat mm-hmm. because at least at the very least you know you're not going to incur more debt for this human being staying alive than you already have, right? And maybe at the best, they pay you back for school or whatever, they, they co-sign the loan. So it's, um, there's always an institutional or, or uh, yeah, I would say institutional. There's always an institutional angle to, to all of these f- uh, pervasive social problems. And I think that the, the issuance of student debt, the idea that like, kids are barely out of school before they're freighted with all this, all these loans, that makes it very, very difficult for them to approach their careers iteratively, right? And that makes, that in turn, on a macro level, if you're providing these guaranteed loans to everybody, it means that people are going to make more conservative choices by nature because debt makes people more conservative. It's just, I, it's just humanity. It's just how we think if we're rational. So, um, so I worry that there could be some kind of like cataclys- cataclysmic end of experimentation or end of like wild youth where uh everybody just gets out of college and goes straight to some loan killing job and that's that would be the worst thing for the economy it'd be the worst thing for this economy it'd be the worst thing for people's happiness i think yeah don't even get me started on college loans that it's insidious man like not only do the students not understand what they get into a lot of times the parents don't uh either like they don't understand the 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 dollar amount on the tuition that they're paying. Like, I don't want to bring my own family into this, but my brother and I strongly convinced my sister to drop out of art school last year. Like, she was going to a very good art school, paying a pretty penny. She's a she's a potter. She's a ceramicist. She was not going to be able to focus on her pottery until her junior year. She's going to have to go hundred hundred grand in debt just to get to like a point where she could then work on what she's good at. So we can like she's good at what she does too. So we're like, and she sells. She's already like at a position where it's like she's selling her pottery, like people like it, and she's making it for people. So we're like, it is not worth worth it for you to go to 120 grand in debt to do something you're already good at. Like go get a job in a studio and yeah. start working that. And she's happier, I, I hope, uh, than she would be, and and a lot less debt than she would be as well. Um, but it is it is a problem. People just get like, hey, this is this is the dream I was fucking told when I grew up. Like you have to do this, this, and this. I'm here checking off college off the list and that just so happens to be hey i'm gonna go 60 to 100 grand in debt don't yeah, worry just i don't to, know what that means just to kick things off <laughs> right <laughs> it's like yeah i mean it, there's a lot of analogies that come to mind but name um, one can we take a quick break yeah, yeah go for it we're breaking at 106.55 all right back from the bathroom break we got pretty off topic there we got pretty cosmic we did but it's true. I think these are important topics to talk about. Um, again, going back to the theme of this episode, I think a lot of people are disconnected from reality, and I think conversations like this help people get a little bit closer or, or back in touch with it. Um, our world is changing at a crazy pace. I mean, that's one thing I think your thesis didn't say outright, but sort of highlighted is is things have changed drastically. Yeah. And I think that that's another theme of this podcast overall is us humans adapting to the pace of change in particular. Like we have never experienced the pace of change in technology, population growth, economic growth ever as a species. Yeah. And I think the reason that our thesis is, is well, one of the motivators for writing the thesis and one of the reasons that I think it's relevant to people even outside Bitcoin is that <clears throat> when more and more people are working in technical roles or ancillary roles to software, it, it becomes very important to, to consider how software gets made and who gets a say in how it's made and who who owns it and who can who can look at it and all the rest and that's um as the economy digitizes 
there are more and more people who are working in pseudo software environments, which was not the case you know, 30 years ago or mm-hmm. something. And, uh, and that can be, I mean, for, for people who are maybe used to getting satisfaction out of jobs in an old fashioned way, like making things with their hands or checking off a list or whatever, you know, sublimating all that into software can, can feel a little unsatisfying or at worst, like a little bit dirty. You know, I think that's, if you've ever like laid in bed all day and just been on the internet, like you don't feel great about yourself at the end of that, right? It's not the, it's not the same process as going to a library and digging through the same topics. So if that's the working world where we have this information portal and we can sort of use it either to earn money or to waste our own time or some combination of both, like it becomes a question of personal choice and discipline. Do I learn skills? Do I read information or do I get paid to essentially be in the matrix and uh do i just hang out and play candy crush all day you know that that's a real that's becoming like a lifestyle choice right so if you if you don't see any personal satisfaction out of at at the end of the tunnel for the former option right like if you don't see how learning skills and and getting good at interacting with people can become satisfying you might be tempted or a new generation of kids might be tempted to just just like waste their lives away on the internet even if it pays them money even if they're earning money passively somehow from doing something on the internet they're never going to be or not never but they may not be happy that way and uh this is the first time that you've had the option of being like a complete blob i think in human history right, right. in, in hi- historically the lowest paying worst jobs were always physically the most arduous and now it's sort of the opposite where the lowest paying worst jobs are mentally stultifying like actually mm-hmm. in Dwayne Reed the other night uh <laughs> I was at the, I was in the checkout line and I went to the cash register and this woman who was running the cash register was on FaceTime and her phone was propped up on the register and she was having a whole conversation with this person and never looked me in the eye never said anything hello or goodbye never asked me for a rewards card nothing it was like she processed my whole thing all of my items without ever interrupting her conversation and at, for a minute I was like there's something kind of dope about that. <laughs> like she's basically at home. <laughs> like she just moves uh, context, right? And she mm-hmm. keeps doing the same thing that she would normally do on a Saturday. But then I thought like, how is she supposed to look forward to going to work every day? Right. So these are two sides of the same coin. And I, I'm worried about how, how these choices get made in the future. Right. I mean, so I mean, the big trend is automation is uh, self-driving cars. And you want to talk about the fucking biggest demographic of workers in this country, it's truck drivers. And you're talking about potentially having the biggest demographic of one, uh, uh, the biggest demographic of workers in the country being displaced over the course of the next 10 years. Or at least male workers. Yeah. 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 Um, that like, the, so that's the thing that worries me. Like we're at the point where the pace of change is changing so quickly that, if self let's use self driving trucks as an example, if they come to fruition, which it seems very possible in the next decade, uh decade to two decades, that's five to eight million jobs, I believe. That's, oh yeah. Yeah. It's a huge proportion of people, working yeah. age people. Yeah, yeah. That's like two percent of the whole population, probably eight percent of the working population. Yeah. More. Which is crazy to think. Like what how do we transition to that? Like, how do you how do you transition an economy during that that type of change? Well, so let me ask you a question. Do you think that everybody should be a knowledge worker? Like, do you think it is? Do you think that there's any merit to the happiness that a person gets from from manual labor or low skilled labor? And should we try to preserve that path to happiness? Um. Just from personal experience, I do think there's value in it. I think I think learning the value of hard work is important. Like I mowed a lot of lawns, I shoveled a lot of driveways, I worked at a hot dog stand for eight summers. Like eight summers? Eight summers, thirteen to twenty one. Damn, man. Yeah, but I do I do think the value of manual labor. I think I like to think it's taught me a lot. But I. Uh, so what did you learn in the eight summers selling hot dogs? There's no such thing as a free lunch. You gotta <laughs> fucking work. <laughs> yeah, every minute when you're paid hourly. Yeah. Yeah. I worked uh landscaping and construction in high school and college. 
Yeah. And it was like just counting down the minutes till 4.30 because we'd start at like 7 or 8 in the morning. And uh, literally anything I could do to pass 10 minutes was my favorite thing to do. And See, I have that, a different experience. So my experience, I worked at a hot dog stand. My hours, I was from 13 to 21. Uh, my hours were 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. I got paid out in cash every day. Um, and I was on the beach, so it was girls coming up talking to the hot dog stand. So it was like a, it was like a, a place to, to rap, uh, spit some game a little bit. And that's pretty great. I will say I will pat myself on the back a little bit. For the last five summers, I didn't miss a day of work. I worked 72 straight days, like just because it was like you got paid every day. Like it was like, hey, I need to go make money. I'm gonna go work. But um, it was a terrible way to get introduced to money, getting paid in cash every day. <laughs> that's <laughs> true. <a> young and <laughs> You're like, yeah. Uh, well, that's all right. So that 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 reinforced some good lessons, probably. I'm guessing. Yeah. Oh, totally. Like, despite getting paid in cash every day. Yeah. yeah. Despite getting paid in cash every day, like, uh, like even when I went to college, like I. My parents supported me a little bit, but I was like, I had, I had to go get a fucking job. Like, I went and worked at a Japanese restaurant for a while. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason, one of the reasons that I went to UVA for college was even out of state. It was like $22,000 a year, which was literally half the price of every other <laughs> college that I got into. And I thought, like, I should do myself a, my, I should do my future self a favor and, like, save some money. And it was also an excellent school, so I didn't feel like I was giving up anything. But, but while I was there during the summers, I would work. I would come back to New York because this is where I'm from and I would do landscaping and construction. And I remember this one particular summer that um, where I was doing landscaping for a, a big like outdoor mall in Westchester. And it was a lot of mulch. I was, I was wheelbarrowing oh, mulch. Mulch is the worst thing to work with. It was mulch. so hot. It was, it was like bucking mulch with a pitchfork into a wheelbarrow and just rinse and repeat like hundreds of times a day. And but the the silver lining of this was that early in the morning when it was really cold out, the mulch would be really warm, mm-hmm. and you could lay on the mulch pile before the bosses showed up. And you could pile mulch on you. You could nap for like twenty minutes. <laughs> It'd be the sweetest twenty minutes of your life. And then as soon as the boss would show up, you know they'd throw shit at you to wake you up, and you have to get to work. But I rem- I remember like now when I look back on that, I really know the value of twenty minutes, which as an office worker now, like 20 minutes fritters away in no time. And, um, so I, I have some, I'm romantic about the world of like the old school world of work and I'm loath to leave that behind. That's yeah. No, but even that being said, like the, the value of 20 minutes, uh, like I work from home now and that's something I'm hyper cognizant of is like, I could easily dick around and waste time. Like it, it has happened. Like I'm not no. gonna lie. Like, <laughs> it happens. But, a couple times a week at least, but uh, you do have to be like, oh shit, like at 20 minutes, I could have gotten this, this, and this. And like, in, especially if you're working from home remotely, which probably going to be the bigger trend going forward. Like it is an adjustment. Like, Hey, I don't have Bubba here to keep me on task. Like, I got to fucking like keep myself motivated. Yeah. But, but that is something uh, I have been working on like the last four years. Like, even though I work from home now, I worked that company, that software Drupal company I worked for, they were based out of Ecuador and I worked here by myself. So like they, even like back then I was at a WeWork by myself, like trying to figure out how to, to structure my day. And it is, it is liberating, but it's also like, holy shit, like it is a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And even just, even just being in your own context like that, being a remote worker is so much different than let's say, well, even 10, but let's say 20 years ago or 30 years ago. You get hired as an entry level something or other in a company and you're part of another class just like you were in high school and college. Oh, this is my class of entry level people and we all kind of rise up the ranks together and there, there's a real group mentality that comes with that and I, my, my sense is that that was the norm until very recently and then, you know, I was born in 84 so I'm not going back that far but my feeling is now that is you, coming out of college it seems like kids are, are free to outsmart the entry-level job system right they can come up with all kinds of ways to work for free and build skills and then ladder that up to something or other but that is now like an every man for himself and herself type of employment scenario where before it was it was much more of a follow the pack like who's hiring now like like plastics haven't you heard plastics right Right. that that's so 1980s like well you gotta go you gotta like skate where the puck is going right that that is not economically how anybody thinks anymore as far as i can tell 
they are much more looking for a match with their internal compass and their internal interests and their values. And it's much less about like, well, you know, what's hot in 2019. Um, no, it's, um, and I, and I find more and more people like coming around to it. Like, all right. Uh, I know people who are like, fuck, I went to college for finance. It's not what I wanted to do at all. And now I'm 10 years in, I fucking regret it. Like, how do I change? Like, what do I do? What do I do? And for any of you out there who have these thoughts, like, just fucking rip the Band-Aid off. That's my recommendation. And, I mean, consider your situation. I, I ripped the Band-Aid off when I was a single, poor, 22-year-old. But um, I do think it was worthwhile for me in general. And it, it, and that's like, I'm fascinated. We fell down this rabbit hole. We haven't really talked about Bitcoin much tonight. But Bitcoin does play a role into this. And in, in, in there's a lot of big transitions and paradigm shifts that are... are ahead of us and being able to identify them and, and react accordingly. Like it's not going to be an easy transition, but just being able to visualize like, Hey, this is probably going to happen in our lifetimes, especially the, the automation automation of the workforce. I mean, it's already happened to a great extent. It's only going to get uh, again, faster and, and, and more extreme going forward. Yeah. Uh, and figure, and that's a lot of like, I don't know all the answers, but those are a lot of big questions that we as a society, I mean, we need to get, reattach to reality and then figure out like how we're going to figure this all out together because it is, it is pretty heavy how, how many people could be left behind or will be, are being left behind yeah. because of the the advancement of technology and, and how fast it's happening. Yeah. And accommodating all these new and fanciful college majors and, and areas of study that don't always have immediate off ramps into employment. It means that there's a lot of people who, pop out of college and oh and they have like a deep sense of something or other it may be it's disconnected from reality dude it could also be that but it could be that they're just very very tuned into one particular dimension of reality like um in addition to so i I took a lot of computer science in college but i also took a lot of art classes uh like sculpture and photography and so if you get like if you just study that stuff and you come out into the world you're going to totally misapprehend how the plumbing of humanity works, right? Like what is really the banking system is not going to be top of mind for you, let's say. Um, but you will interpret everything through the lens that you created with your education. And so you'll think that the solution is this or that. And it, it just creates more, uh, it creates a broader spectrum of opinion. And it creates, it makes it harder for people to consolidate on one viewpoint, which is, which is probably in the abstract a good thing, right, for people to develop different viewpoints, but it makes it really difficult to come to common ground and decide how do we build a system that all humans with human needs and human wants can survive in. And uh, and that's ultimately why I love Bitcoin. because Right? It, it provides this... It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't, and it provides a common mission on us. Like, hey, we, we can make a better world, like a better monetary system at least, and then on top of that monetary system, a better world. At least that's what I believe. Yeah. Um, it's a monetary co-op is what it is. Yeah. It's an acknowledgement that we have this common problem or a common need, and that uh, if we let one or, or a group of people fix that common need themselves, they're going to come up with a solution that's awfully self-serving. And, you know, one of our engineers um, used to run the Park Slope Food Co-op, like all their technical systems. And the, the Park Slope Food Co-op is a fantastic social experiment in, you know, cooperative retail where people own, people co-own, residents of Park Slope in Brooklyn, co-own this, this co-op and they contribute a few hours of work a week and uh, as a result they're able to buy produce at basically at cost or, or close to cost. And But that means that the infrastructure for that co-op has to be minimal, right? It can't, mm-hmm. you, you, people are, the, the reason that they're working, uh, at the co-op a few hours a week and the reason they're members of the co-op and they're involved in the politics of the co-op is because they get really good produce at cost or near cost. So if you start to introduce margins on top of that, the co-op system becomes just the same as any other supermarket, right? And why would you put sweat equity into a supermarket if you're not getting cheaper food? All right. And so the situation we have now is is that with money. And, and I think Bitcoin feels like a cooperative monetary system where we all have to do more work individually or we all have to do more. We have to, we have to all pitch in in some respect, whether it means, you know, running a full note or doing a podcast to help people understand stuff. But at the end of the day, it gives you cheaper access to value transfer. 
Right. And so like any co-op, you know, the payoff is well worth the work, I think, uh, for everybody in the group. Yeah. And that, um, this conversation reminded me, I pulled up my phone here in a group chat with my college friends. I had my, uh, semi-annual Bitcoin shill in my college group. It was like, <laughs> somebody brought up Bitcoin. I was like, Hey, this will be like the one time every six months where I say it, it might be a good idea to get some, but yeah. the idea of money in Venezuela came up like because of what's going on. And one of my buddy Fabio said, money runs the world rather than the good of humanity, which is fucked. And I said, well, you can't leave the levers of money creation in the hands of man. It should be done by nature, AKA gold or technology, Bitcoin. So man doesn't corrupt it, which is inevitable in any system run by a hierarchy of men. Um, and I think that's, Simple, but like that uh, was like for me, like just explaining that to my college friends who don't like explaining in that way. Like, money should be left out of the hands of men, whether it's gold, which I would argue has been bastardized by men via uh, supply concentration, or Bitcoin. Once you have the fiat system, the central banking system, you allow men to control the levers. That's what bastardizes it. So, Bitcoin is sort of a reversion to what we had for thousands of years, which is hard for people to see as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I get that. Not a re- like a, a mental, not a mental reversion, but like a concept reversion upgraded many times over. I yeah, it, it's a reversion to a, um, a a more fair game. Like I, I, whenever I think about central banking, I think about what. So I'm a hockey fan and a, like a Rangers fan, and I I think. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> hey, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> they've been they've been winning lately. Um, uh, I keep thinking like, what would what would hockey be like if there was no offsides? Like, what if you just removed uh, critical rules that contributed to momentum? So you're scoring a lot, great. You have a, you have your the puck is constantly in the offensive zone, great. Well, if there's no offsides, uh, a slight offensive advantage becomes a blowout. Right, mm-hmm. and and so any system, and that that's a very boring game to watch. It's a very boring game to play. So any system where one group of people is better with that set of rules than, than another is not just it's not just unfair because unfairness is not in principle good or bad. It just is the state of things. It's just very boring. It's very boring. It makes people not want to participate. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think this is why pr- probably a you know a massive proportion of our generation is watching Netflix right now instead of doing any number of things that would advance their their personal situation because the feeling is like the rules are such that 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 may I may not even know all the rules and I certainly can't take advantage of them to my to, to my benefit so I will just hang out and do as little as possible right? Let me watch the second s- firefly doc or fire <laughs> festival doc <laughs> right right exactly this is and something I'm guilty of too but I haven't watched it yet so I'm out of the loop but yeah, I, f- I think if if fewer people were watching Netflix, there'd be more people challenging central bank sovereignty, things like that, right? You make the game boring enough and it becomes a a status quo situation where people can't compete, don't want to compete, lose interest in everything, and they just want to get fucked up all the time. And that's basically where we're at. Yeah, yeah, get fucked up all the time, man. The beer commercials, the lull ya. Like, that's like, somebody, there was a tweet that came down, like, my tweet deck the other day, like, just making, like, tr- making fun of the fact, like, every Sunday, especially between September and February, like, in America, if you're a grown male above the age of 18, you're expected to sit on your couch, drink beer, watch football, and cheer for other grown men. Like, that is literally every Sunday for four months what a man in America is expected to do. And that's yeah. Not very productive. No. It's the same shit every year. The Patriots are going to go to the pa- the Super Bowl <laughs> and the AFC Championship. Like, you don't really get anything out of it. Yeah. Except for misery, especially if you're an uh, Indy Eagles fan before 2018. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. It is. No, it is. Like, we are in this weird, weird state. And the Wall Street Journal had an article on the front page today about makeup for women that is meant to be worn at the gym. It's like sweat proof, oh wa- waterproof. And the tone of the article was right on, which is like, gee, do you have to good, look good like all the time now? You have to good, look good even when you're pouring sweat and working really hard. And it's like this over uh, overemphasis on s- your value in the sexual marketplace as a replacement for 
other occupations which might be more dangerous to to the powers that be or to the status quo right you can't you're not you're not overturning or or interrupting any societal norms if you are preoccupied with your appearance <laughs> Right, you know what and, I mean. And you're you're preoccu- neutralized, or preoccupied with the Kardashians, or Vanderpump Rules, or whatever fucking show or distraction it is. I would argue, like again, like so. This is uh, let's get a little fucking controversial here with the fucking Covington Catholic boys thing over the weekend. Like that was like an incident between maybe a hundred people in a country of three hundred and twenty million people, and the fucking hysteria that has been wi- like riled up in the wake of that event. It's like you people are fucking controlled to a T here. Like all somebody has to do is post a 30 second clip of something taken completely out of context. And you literally rile up the animal spirits of hundreds of million people. People are like legitimately angry and they don't even understand like exactly what happened, why they're angry. They're angry because they're being told to be angry and people don't realize that they are fucking being controlled by the media. Right. And I the, said and it. I said it. Oh, yeah. And, and there are going to be people that listen to this and think and think immediately like well one side one side was right or the other side was right and that is completely missing the point right the point is that you it's the framing you're put it, in the way to think it is the it, it's not just that it's you're thinking publicly you're thinking out loud you're you're producing a commodity which is your emotional reaction so uh whether you call it fake news or anything else like the 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 media the powers of be um who ha- have influence on the narrative they put stuff out there which is, and I spent years working in media, so I watched this process like, like gestate. So I know exactly how purposeful it is. They put things out there that they know are going to get a reaction, right? And they call this relevance. <laughs> this is a fancy <laughs> word. They, 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 what, what they mean by relevant? They're it's like, so oh, this, well, is, yeah. this is really relevant, which means it's really going to piss people off, and they're going to they're going to be beside themselves with fury, such that they have to like type some stream of consciousness stuff and, and then hit enter, right? And that you once you've done that. Now you're in the machine. You're in the commodification machine. Mm-hmm. And it is a machine that manufactures, like, quote, unquote, authentic human emotional reactions, which other humans, because we have ancient biology, which has been outrun by tech, we are sympathetic to seeing other humans have really, really emotional reactions. That indicates something important to us. And so we stop what we're doing, and we're like, oh, look at who's pissed about what. And we never realize that this is all... A it's, ruse. It's a ruse. It's a ruse. Yeah, it's a it's ruse. Like, it's all you know, advertising. You know who played this ruse perfectly the last two weeks? Two companies in particular, Gillette and Gemini. Oh, Gemini, Gemini played Bitcoiners and crypto like a fucking fiddle. Gillette, let me say something about Gillette. Gillette pu- published a book in uh, 19, I want to say like 1904, maybe 1910, called The Gillette Industrial System. And it was a fully scoped vision of corporate socialism really yeah and it is terrifying it's terrifying in how how accurate it is i mean for something that's over a hundred years old i mean it predates the central bank it predates uh the roaring 20s it predates all of the kind of speculative phenomena that we consider to be um, endemic of the early 20th century and yeah look it up i'm pretty sure it was 1905 oh okay um so the, the the idea that uh the idea that you could bring people up in a matrix of social wants that are always unsatisfied has been the dream of every corporate scion for at least a hundred years, right? Not only not only corporate corporate like states. So I I was actually I fell down a a Yuri uh Bezmanov rabbit hole this week. Oh, I don't know this guy. So Yuri uh, Bezmanov was a KGB defector who came to the United States in 1980s and basically explained how Soviet Russia used the media to sort of subvert uh, public opinion and uh, in the long run, like, subvert the, the fucking government and the structure of society and basically explained how it might happen here in the U.S. in, like, the early 1980s and everything has played out to a T. Like, left, first, right. Like, just divide and conquer just create strife like that's what people like if any of you freaks are listening to this, this podcast out there like people are out there trying to divide what we have to realize is most of us 99.9 percent of us have more in common than the 0.01 percent that are trying to control everything via the media and yeah they are 
it's all of us against the people that have the very small group of people that have a stake in the existing financial system yeah who have all been the same families for like at least 100 years more like 250 or 300 years and if you're not one of them you're a loser and you should never <laughs> take their side because they also think you're a loser and an idiot for, you know for for propping up a system that only benefits them yeah and they manipulate you like people like people that don't realize they're being like and this is another one I, you know what we're going to do it again we're going to go there we're going to go to climate change so climate change is another oh. one <laughs> that pisses me the fuck off oh because God. dude the Maldives has been falling on the water in 12 years for the last 50 years. Well, you know we got 12 years of Earth left. Yeah, dude. 12, the Earth's going to die AOC. in 12 years. Listen, yeah. I do not deny that the climate is definitely changing. Climate change is like throughout humanity. But the framing, again, the framing, the, the fear-mongering of, hey, the world's going to end in 12 years if we don't change. If, if, if we don't put guns to your head and take your money to figure out how to fix this problem when we're probably not going to be able to as a government and a bureaucracy that can't get shit done to think that they're going to be able to figure out global warming number one and then to fall for their fucking divisive fucking fear monger number know, two i know it's like you're being manipulated <laughs> but what's so great is that she what's funny is that she not we're not talking to, about alexandria ocasio cortez who came out and said the world's going to end in 12 years because of because of global warming yeah yeah and that we shouldn't worry about how much it costs to fix it because if the world ends, there's, you know, she insinuated there's like no point to anything. So um, what I think is amazing is how she says this stuff and then the older people in her party immediately distance themselves, right? It's like full Heisman treatment because they don't believe that, right? Mm -hmm. They're willing to let you believe that. They're willing to let their paid promotion groups put ads out there that say that but they will never say that because they know that's not the case right and she i think is going to be amazing because we're all going to watch her get red pilled on the national stage I she's going to so. she's going to push this agenda she has tremendous enthusiasm behind her she's going to push this agenda to the point where it becomes necessary to get some solid science behind this and the science is not going to be there and that's going to be or like a, a really amazing moment in history. I think. Yeah. And my biggest problem with global warming in general is like the solution to all these problems is taxing people and just taking money when the solution to the problem should be planting more fucking trees. Let's create more oxygen to pull the CO2 from the, the atmosphere. Oh, but haven't you heard carbon dioxide's a <laughs> greenhouse gas? So is water vapor. We better eliminate all this shit because it's all, it's ridiculous. I know. Um, but you can't talk about this. Chris, we can't talk about this. We're crazy. We're crazy. We are. We must be. What's the fashionable term for like bad person now? I don't even know. Climate deniers. Deplorable. Are we deplorables? That's already out of vogue. I think yeah. there must be a new term. <laughs> <laughs> there must be a new term. There's always a new term. Uh, uh, but, but I, I mean, this is like, like. No, and again, like I'm not like, and again, uh, like, uh, global warming is just an example of framing that is used to divide people. To, to literally, hey, and that's like the one thing. This is a fight my sister-in-law get into a lot. In particular, she's like, and she has said, like, you gotta think of like, you gotta think of your nephew. Like, I'm not gonna name his name, but like, think about your nephew. And I'm like, I am thinking about my nephew. Like, if you, like, honestly think that the world is gonna end in 12 years, like, there are there are better options than than like forcing this 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 weird framing of this debate, like. It's it's not black or white. The world's not going to end in twelve years. Things may be getting worse. I'm like, there's definitely more CO two in the atmosphere, but like, I don't think throwing money at the problem is going to solve it. Um, I think we should plant more trees. And that was my thoughts on gl climate change. I hope you freaks are still here. I hope you don't leave. <laughs> That's this is what I think. Did we lose everybody? Oh, we lost know. all the green people. I don't think so. Should we bring it back to Bitcoin? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Let's bring it back. I mean, that ultimately, in a monetary system with a fixed rate of emission... Exactly. You, Bitcoin's you yeah, you can't get away with uh, fanciful taxes. You can't get away with... Right, people have a much lower tolerance for, for all kinds of legislation that affects money if the issuance is finite. So much of legislation sort of presupposes, like, oh, we'll just print some money for that, right? Like, uh, that's a... That's sort of the, the budget, right? It's it's money that we will create in the future to, to spend on things that we need. If that had to come out of pre-existing money or it had to it had to balance itself with pre-existing debt, we would never get the spurious 
spending that we have and we would have a different narrative about what needs to be done when and how soon and how much it should cost. Yeah, if you're really an environmentalist want to save the world, Bitcoin is your answer. It cannot fund wars which destroy the world, send planes and armies all over the world, adding CO2 emissions to the atmosphere, destroying countries, rebuilding them, which takes even more fossil fuels, uh, and then just basically enabling the uh, the wasteful spending of printed money to to use more energy that is the fiat system if you want a a, a system that uh will be uh much more efficient with the way money is used and invested and therefore the resources and the fossil fuels and energy sources are are used in this economy bitcoin might be the answer for you yeah central banks generally exist to finance central governments and they're not financing your personal war they won't lend you Ten million dollars to go to, to go to war with some guy that runs Greenpoint. They're only interested in lending you money in excess if you are the head honcho. <laughs> you know, so it's it's a. Um, to, I got, your, to your point, it's it becomes a much different world when when everybody's money is sort of held equal. Yeah, I got beef with Greenpoint. So if anybody wants to fund a ten million dollar <laughs> war with Greenpoint, let me know. <laughs> um, Chris, thank you for going down this path with me. It's yeah. an hour and forty. I'm sorry for bringing you down this path. I didn't even mean to like go off on this tangent, but I think it is important. Like these are important topics that, I mean, hard truths that a lot of people need to come to grips with. Like our economy is changing, technology is changing at a crazy pace, and you couple that with, uh, basically irresponsible monetary policy, and you got a tinderbox, the likes of which history hasn't seen. I would argue, but. Um, We'll see. Let's end it on an optimistic note. Okay. Iterative. Let's talk about your OTC desk and like sort of like your full full stack sort of vision for how uh, a Bitcoin company from a mining pool to to an OTC desk uh, may look in the future. Yeah. So, well, there's a lot there. I, I think. Uh, so I'll start by saying for, for anybody that's still listening this late in the podcast, you deserve to know that. Uh, that Bitcoin has a tendency to consolidate and that anybody who's been in Bitcoin since I would say the 2014 go around has seen how how quickly you can how quickly you can see growth and you can see venture capital follow that growth and then you very quickly you see a crash and consolidation and that is very difficult for VCs to wrap their heads around because they're used to out and out growth for like a decade or more before a certain subsector of tech or whatever consolidates maybe even more, maybe 20 years, whatever it's taken for social media since 2004 till now when we have our incumbents, right? That's 15 years. So um, so it, it's shocking to people from from the private equity world that Bitcoin has this pattern of inflating, consolidating, inflating bigger, consolidating more, inflating bigger, consolidating again. And one of the reasons that we touch so many different layers of the Bitcoin stack is that I don't think that, well, I, I think that by virtue of Bitcoin being software, any service that relates to Bitcoin is also software. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there's no reason for you to isolate yourself in one layer of the monetary stack because the whole point of developing, so the whole point of software is zero marginal cost for, for services. That once you find product market fit with a, with a piece of software or software service, you can deploy it to everyone that needs it. And it's basically zero marginal cost. Um, so I think that pays dividends doubly in in digital commerce where you ideally want a system where um, where people can build whatever they want and when they find something that works they can scale it without too much additional overhead and that's not the way the exist I mean the existing financial system does not welcome entrepreneurship so um, not not to leave things on too loose of a thread but I think that that's why we can see, we see the entire stack consolidating essentially that mm -hmm. the people who are mining are also the liquidity providers and they are also going to be the people that know when to trade and what to trade and who to trade it with and that all of this knowledge is sort of a virtuous uh, is, a, is a virtuous cycle so um, you know I should say please do visit i2trading.com if you want to buy large blocks of, of Bitcoin or other proof-of-work cryptos. Um, but you'll see when you visit that site or you talk to our traders that they really have a pulse on what miners are feeling, what other desks are feeling when it, when it comes to Bitcoin or things like Grin and 
um, and Beam, which are some of the new talked about co coins this month. Um, it helps to be involved at every level of the stack. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's something and I've sort of been waiting for it. Like it's always seemed innate to me, like a miner should be an exchange as well. Right. At the end of the day, like, it, like why even like throw any more middlemen into it? And I think uh, yeah. just mining in particular being an industry filled with uh, people who may not understand the full stack or finance and hardware and software. I feel like you guys are, are, are doing something very unique right now. And when you describe the stack to me, it's like, holy shit, this is like, this makes a lot of sense. Thank and you. Yeah. I think we're probably the only American mining group that manufactures its own machines. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah it, it is crazy. I mean, people have literally told us that's crazy. We, yeah. We've been told that we're liars, that we don't really have <laughs> these machines. Like, and I've, you know, be happy to sign any number of public addresses that, that well you got a bang up team you and brandon have built uh, a hell of a team leo and martin are leo and martin is sharp as sharp as whatever <laughs> very sharp uh <laughs> but leo in particular is the, like i've had a lot more conversations with him than martin but leo and mining and his knowledge of the mining industry is 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 uh bar none probably probably like the highest caliber i've i've experienced in this space well, thank you. I think the same thing. I haven't talked to anybody that understands the ecosystem as well as our guys do. And at this point, they get it more than I do. And uh, and that gives me great pleasure, right, that they can continue to double down on there. I mean, Leo is, um, if if anybody doesn't know, Leo, Leo Zhang, who is our head of research, has thrown himself at mining in the last two years. And Leo has an interesting background. He you know, he studied math at Stanford, and his dad is a, is a computer science professor back in China. And he comes from an investment banking work background and he he c kind of had the same intuition that I had when we met in 2016 it was like everybody's talking about ICOs and what's the you know what's the right coin and neither of us really cared about any of that we were really focused on like what are these miners up to they don't talk to anybody they don't share any information nobody talks about them and yet they are the critical commodity in this whole ecosystem is hash power where are people getting it? Who's providing it? Why? Um, like, what, what, what are the economic? Like this, this is a fucking real industrial scale business. And everybody in New York wants to talk about creating some goddamn ether token. <laughs> like what could be less interesting that, you know, than it takes two seconds to make an ether token, right? It takes years to put together a large scale mine and do it without getting your face ripped off. So there was something just naturally higher risk, higher reward about mining that, that attracted us to it. And he has... You know, by virtue of, of being Chinese and speaking Chinese, he has access to, you know, 50% more of the market than I do as an English speaker. And um, and it's shocking how much the Chinese market knows that the American market does not and vice versa. Yeah, I think this is a good ending topic. That was like, what, how big is the... the uh the gap between east and west when it comes to this. Like, oh, it's gigantic. It's right? gigantic, but it's, 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 it's so much bigger than crypto. It has to do... I mean... The most, I'm passionate about this because um, every time we do financings now, we for any of our businesses, we always talk to American VCs and family offices, and we talk to Chinese VCs and Chinese family offices. And routinely, the American VCs are more ideological. They are more narrative-driven. They are more abstract with the things that they think they want. And speaking to Chinese VCs and Chinese family offices, much less ideological, much less idealistic about, I mean, I haven't spoken to a single Chinese miner or, or investor who thinks that ICOs are a legitimate f uh, vector for selling equity, right? Like they all know that it's bullshit. They all, they all call it, they call it uh, reaping garlic chives which is uh, garlic chives are a di like a dish in southern China. So all the miners are southern Chinese. They're also from Sichuan. And um, a delicious dish that, that, that I recommend you get if you go to southern China is garlic chives, which are just chives that are cooked in, in garlic and butter. And they grow very fast. You know, chives are like grass. Mm -hmm. So they call ICOs garlic chives because it's a, it's a, thr it's a weed. It's literally a weed <laughs> that, you, that you like harvest and cook and consume and then you're done with it, right? It's not... It's not an oak tree. It's a it's a it's a blade of grass. And there's a fundamental disconnect in the United States where 
people get really caught up going back to the enterprise software narratives and like people here are so steeped in marketing that they can't stop talking about the world 20 years from now and they never stop to consider like what is it going to take to get us from this year to next year and china in in my anecdotal and very limited experience has a much more of a zero to one mentality where it takes a lot for them to get excited about something and they're willing to participate in things that make money but they're they're not fooled that that's that speculation is the future Mm -hmm. whereas here i look at what coinbase is doing uh, and it looks to me like they're building a a a web-based casino for ether tokens and like the world does not need this you know like nobody's retirement portfolio needs any of that garbage and um so you know i i think that there's going to be a reckoning not you know not too far off from now where uh people realize where the real value is yeah interesting no and like that's something that fascinates me like going back so my first bit des meet up here in new york was right after the hong kong agreement and that was the first time i really became cognizant of like the difference between the chinese miners the western developers and sort of the ecosystem and the like is there a need to bridge the gap culturally do you think for bitcoin to survive or do you think this sort of uh uh de-alienation of cultures and sort of misunderstanding actually helps bitcoin survive to an extent uh that's a good question it's it's hard to tell because the 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 thing that the thing that is always surprising to me culturally is that um in the U.S., I've noticed that investors are not likely to invest in things that run counter to their values, even if they make money. I mean, some some investors will, uh, but a, but a lot of people act. Maybe it's just acting, but they act scrupulous. They they, you know, if they think something's wrong, they don't invest in it, even if they know that there's something in it for them. Whereas the feeling that I get from talking to folks in China is, and, and some of this is you know secondhand also, um, is that everyone believes in Bitcoin and everyone is also willing to speculate on other stuff, but they don't put it in the same category as Bitcoin. They would never confuse it with Bitcoin. Oh really? Yeah. And that, that is really refreshing, right? When we talk to manufacturers who make ASIC machines, they consider making machines for secondary networks or, or non Bitcoin networks to be non core and kind of a distraction. And if they're going to make, you know, a Zcash ASIC or a Decred ASIC or a Litecoin ASIC, like somebody needs to give them a really good reason, which means that somebody needs to basically give them enough money to anchor a batch of machines. Otherwise, they're only interested in making Bitcoin machines. They don't really have uh, a motivation for any of the other. And so I think that's that's really telling. You know, they know that there's that there's one thing that is the real deal and that these other things can give them short-term benefits but shouldn't be uh, messed with too much. Mm-hmm. And... I also feel that way. That's fascinating. I never knew that. Um, we're almost two hours in here. Thanks for coming on this journey. It's been the like most wide-ranging conversation I've had in a while. Thanks. It's been liberating. I hope I uh, hope I didn't drag you down too many too many rabbit holes here. No, I don't think I said anything that was too foot and mouth. No, I hope I didn't. I usually do, but who cares? <laughs> That's the nature of being a <laughs> podcast host. <laughs> Is it, yeah, after a certain number of hours, <laughs> you're going to say something. After the Yamazaki, the bottle goes empty. Yeah. Uh, but this has been a pleasure. Thank you, Marty. Thanks for coming in. It's a long time coming. You're, again, you're one of my favorite people to talk about Bitcoin with in this city in particular. I'm very impressed with the team that you have uh, built, the thesis that you guys wrote. Uh, I think it's very underrated in the space, and then your vision for the future is just innately makes sense to me. Thanks. Thanks. And for people who don't know, you can go to iterative.capital slash thesis and read the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And there's mm-hmm. also a, an audio version. And the iterative, like outside of Marty's bent, has the hottest daily newsletter. Uh, <laughs> Number two. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, if, 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 you, we'll take it. if you don't want to get shitpost and actually good, dense information to your inbox every day, Leo's uh, does a great job with your newsletter. True, he does. And uh, and you guys do what, like a weekly piece like this week was on lightning um, buying data. Yes, yeah, um, so. the the weekly and monthly pieces are going to get longer and longer as we hire. We're twelve people now, uh, and I think by the end of the year we'll be twenty. So, yeah, count on more. Hell yeah, can't wait. Um, this isn't the last time you'll be in the studio. I hope not. Um, it's been a pleasure. Peace and love, freaks. Cheers.